one thing that we are not contributing Islamist development in other countries. Uh, we we so much engage in uh, retails, uh, wholesales, and we are saying that we are selling a product, we are buying a product, and yet we are doing a lot of importation than producing our own. And even when we have to produce our own, we all we so much import the sophisticated machineries from out of the continent to come and um, uh, purify, modify some of our things. So we are not so much into mechanical industrialization, or let us say uh, into sophisticated industrialization, but we are into the transformation of these uh, products that we have. The, 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 I mean, just like, let me give an example, getting the mangoes, making juice and whatever. So that is um, that brings an element of cosmetic value of a product, but not the substantive value of a product. And yet, yes, we can consider the fact that we are having some element of transformation here and there, but I think it's not enough. And probably it's just because we have uh, we have less people uh, uh, engaged in the private sector. And even those who are engaged in the private sector are always in small scale. Uh, the problem now becomes a little bit complex in that sometimes we now tend to argue that the transnational corporations, the multinational corporations are taking the space. And that comes with the idea of neoliberalism. But the truth is that also they are already taking a vacuum, a space that is vacuum. So they are now taking advantage of that. And that makes us become victims of the external threats than becoming controllers of our economy. And yes, uh, we talk about the foreign aid and being victims of dependency. But truly, yeah, we can also argue on that case that really we are, uh, our economies are so dependent on external aid or aid from outside. But even when we to argue that, we just see it in the perspective of a government. We don't see it in the perspective of individual uh, basis. Let, let me give an example. Uh, some of you might be uh, sponsored by private individuals who are in the outside world. Uh, some of you are, uh, are recipients of uh, donations and, um, and uh, some aid from uh, your churches that are being sponsored by outside worlds. And it really, it really becomes complex. Even those who argue that the government is so dependent, they are also victims or they are also uh, people who depend on some other people who are out of the country. And truly, we, we say that we can't really avoid that argument. The dependency is something that we cannot avoid. But there's a question of how do we have a balance between the two? Because if at all we are just only depending on the external world and we're not producing, we're not making the external world make us feel like we're important to produce for it, then we become the victims of its changes. So we argue on the aspect of being agents of change than being victims of change. And the victim, being victims of change means that we are just victims of globalization, neoliberalism, but sincerely speaking, we are not owning the race, and that makes us victims of uh, a very uh, advanced uh, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, we become victims of technological advancement in the external world. Yes, right now we have issues of um, uh, digitalization of the economy and uh, high sophisticated machineries, uh, artificial intelligence. But much as we all argue in the case of saying that this is what we should adopt as Africans, we are just adopting, but we are not we're not being part of the process. We're just recipients of those advancements, but we are not being part of the process of making those or being part of the people who are making such advancements. So it becomes a problem. And whenever we are going to even make those advancements, I'll, my last point, even though we have to make those advancements, we look up to the Western world to fund our our research, and that becomes a problem. So in a in hundred years to come, they'll say that this was a research made by uh, the Norway uh, organization, but they won't say that it is Joram who made it in Uganda. So those are issues that really, they're very complex and I feel like, yeah, I think my other friends might also capture some of that, or they might even expand on that, but literally to my case, that's what I feel is a problem at the moment. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Richard, uh, let's take from LM. LM says Africa is dependent. Africa does lack specialization. Uh, when you look at uh, Adam Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nation, he says one of the best way, one of the way to create wealth is specialization. 
why is the government's paradox in Africa not directing or trying to solve the questions for African continent? Mr. Richard, why is governance seeming not to be a solution to Africa challenges? Thank you very much. Uh, Joram, again, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think uh, the problem is, um, the problem of governance is there, but the rock bottom of the issue is um, a question of leadership. <clears throat> Joram, the, 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 the mandate that the African people got after independence and the mandate that they went through to our current stage of development and analysis is um, way forged within the, the issue of perception. And that is my first point. Uh, perception is how we see things, the lens we use to see things. And this is the problem that we're having as Africa. And that's the number one problem. You know, the question of specialization as, as RM has, has put it out and very many factors they has given are all right. But they have one big solution which is a, a solution to do with the leadership. We succeeded the regime that we, we succeeded a leadership uh, doctrine that we cannot handle, and that is democracy. Remember, it enables us to choose, it enables the system of democracy enables Africa to choose lumpens over sense. It enables Africa to choose fools over interests. It has seen Africa having dimwits into the House of Representation, into Parliament, and has seen Africa succeed in selling whatever it has got as resources to the imperialists. I'm going to give an example within the legal doctrine. If you look at the laws, it doesn't matter if you're living in an area where there is gold, understand what is happening. As long as the Parliament passes the law, and then the government borrow money, the government will go ahead to borrow money in exchange for gold. We've seen a lot of laboratories being constructed in Africa today uh, to do hybrid, to do GMOs, to do plastic eggs, which has accumulated the level of cancer within Africa and causing the expenditure that a common man would, would be saving to start businesses and do this level of, of, of specialization. So the perception uh, of Africans and globally, the way we see things is extremely important. You know, we cannot compare Uganda, which got independence in 1962 and started industrialization, which we call effective industrialization, having industrial parks and production in just 2010, to the US, which by 1962 already was under the second evolution under industrialism. I think we haven't built that capacity. I have been. Richard, we are losing you. We are losing Richard. Uh, I think you can hear me. Uh, let us take on Grandi. Grandi, has, the, has governance been a challenge to Africa? Has governance actually trade us? What route do you think Africa should take? to solve its numerous problems, the problem of diseases, the problem of conflicts and dictatorship. Uh, we see today Uganda is not is, is taking Kenya to court because of fuel importation. We see last year Uganda and, K and Rwanda they are log ahead. We see coup, coups in, in Western Uganda in Western Africa. We see conflict in Congo. These are all lack, these all have causes. What do you think could be the problem? And we are looking at governance. Is it the, the, uh, is it the problem or what? We are not getting you. 
can yes, I don't can ask you cannot you cannot get you you can it can ask you are mute can ask you are you are mute unmute unmute yourself please okay thank you very much mr joram i hope you can listen to me now yes yeah thank you yeah so on the question of governance on whether it has it, it is has been good for africa or how it is taking on africa i would like also to start from where my colleagues have stopped um mr lm and mr richard how they have explained about governance i would like to start from there and say that uh, governance it's sort of because it is in various ways they have different governance systems that people have embraced to take on their nations. So governance itself is not a problem, but it is which governance that the people have employed, the, go the government has employed. Because gov the governance is a system that, in that in includes the, the state it's sort of the civil society, the markets, the people, on ground, the individuals, all of them are all included in governance because they all play different roles. But strictly on Africa, generalizing Africa, not just speaking on the on Uganda or what, generalizing on Africa, I was going to say like other people have, we are talking about the problems that, that, that have faced the governance systems of Africa. I would like to say that it all started with colonialism whereby before colonialism, Africa was organized and we were one, there were no boundaries. And when these guys came, they preached messages that proved to us that they are better than us and that their systems of governance were also better than ours, which they found because formerly we Africans were organized in small groups of kingdoms, chiefdoms, uh, clans, tribes, and we had lead leadership in, in such ways and also people economically were also interchanging on a voluntary basis and doing uh, economic activities and exchanging ideas, exchanging goods on a voluntary basis. But later when the colonialists came, they tried to show like they, for them they can be dictators. You saw how the colonialists were here for more than 70 years and there were no elections and everything was on dictatorship. So it is the colonialists that destroyed. They brought their socialism. They, they made us become independent on them and they developed in us the inferiority complex and brought their, uh, their difficult complex governance systems like democracy of which here in Africa for us, we are contented with our kingdom, with our kings and our but these guys centralized everything and made it so complex for us to come out. So on governance and on how these people are fighting and everything is what we need is one, we have a problem whereby our leaders think the best solution is of a stay in power. And people also, we are also, Inferior, we have that inferiority complex, believe in democracy, whereby we also feel like if we have another president, then we could solve our problems. Yet, before the coming of all these systems, Africans were living on their own. They, they, were, they were creative, they were innovative, they had, this, they, they, had, they had very many activities which they were doing, and life was was a live and let live. So what, what, what is currently the biggest problem is that people are believing so much in free things and also believing so much in government solving their problems. I think this is the, not the right time you are giving me to give the solutions. But let me first explain the problems, like how other guys have, As you conclude have, have done. In a minute. Yes. So that so those are the problems that we are facing. Is that one colonialism and then that inferiority complex that the, the, the Europeans and their governance systems and 
everything that they, they brought here is the one which is great. But if we can solve that through the ways which I will talk about later, Africa can be a great one. And those uh, conflicts which we are talking about, Uganda taking Kenya into court and everything, want to be here again. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Africa is a dependent state, I mean continent. We see Angola, we see Congo, we see Uganda, Rwanda, they're all dependent states, the dependent countries that are seriously and critically undebited. China, IMF, and other entities. Uh, the question is, how have been debts a problem to Africa? Because we see uh, countries are indebted, they're getting many debts from, for example, China, from IMF, but the problem of Africa seems not to be moving. The problem, this money is, the loan seem not to be impacting the citizens of Africa. Uh, because we don't see a problem with borrowing, but what has this money been used is the question. If we are trying to analyze the question of debts in Africa, we see it as a problem. Elam, what do you say about the debts in Africa? Uh, thank you very much, Joram, for giving me this opportunity again. I would want to revert back. In two minutes, in two minutes. I don't have to give an analysis by, before I tell you what is the problem. Yeah, the argument has been brought clearly by Kakande uh, before he went off that uh, leader, there's a leadership problem. And uh, coming back to coming back to my colleague, uh, Grande, he complains that the colonialists are the problem. And to me, I consider something internal. I think uh, we, we must also sometimes find a problem. The argument that uh, the external world is now the one causing the problem makes us become lamenters. And sometimes we become uh, people who just over talk and we don't have a solution. But sincerely speaking, I feel like, yeah, there's always that argument between do Africans lack leaders or they lack strong political institutions. That becomes a problem that should now push us push us down to the issue of corruption, to the issue of uh, the debts we have, uh, in reference to um, to great works like uh, the one of uh, of uh, Moyo. I, I mean, uh, Moyo, who talks about uh, debt aid, it's very critical that you should understand how aid doesn't develop people. But in my language, they would say that um, borrowed salt can't sustain a visitor. It is true that sometimes these aids are, 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 are like a basic way of handling people who feel like taxation is really immoral or it's not of a good thing. Because as a continent or as a country, we really complain about the taxation levels. But when you go to this Western world, the Europe's, they talk about even the USA, the taxations are all so high. But now as a country that is always complaining about the poverty levels and all that, you realize that the government has no option but to opt for uh, what for 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 debt. Truly speaking, that uh, some of these African uh, institutions are so corrupted; they are really infilt infiltrated with people who are selfish. But I would leave, I would love to uh, give um, a basic analysis of how this happens. Uh, talking about uh, some uh, great scholar called A.K. He wrote an article on the colonialism and the two publics, talking about how. Uh, a certain group of people emerged after colonialism in Africa, and these were the African bourgeoisie. And these are the, at the same time, uh, at the same time they are considered the politicians. At the same time, they are considered also the what? The business class. So uh, while in Europe, the business class or the bourgeoisie were like the second class citizen, or like they were like the middle class uh, on top of the noble. In Africa, here the African bourgeoisie meant the people were on top. So it is analysis to say that. There's a conflict between our primordial public and the civic public. That's the public sector. The primordial is our religious institutions, uh, the our cultural institutions, our voluntary associations, our tribes all together. So the problem has been that we have always been uh, having a contradiction between these two publics, and it has 
determine the kind of politics we play right now. Most of our African leaders, whenever they go into power, they are, they are all considering the fact that they have to fight and scramble for the resources in, 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 in reference to where, to the people they lead or to the people where they have a much uh, clear relationship with. So I talk of this, talk about how the MPs operate, how the bureaucrats operate, and how they swindle sums of money from the public sector to their local entities. The local entities that have remained underdeveloped up to now, yet these local entities receive sums of money from these rich bureaucrats, from these rich politicians, and yet there's no development in those societies. And the problem has become so tough that it has really they have considered the public sector as a sector that can never be impoverished. And that has made it very easy for them to always plunder the public sector. And in that process of plundering the public sector in reference to helping their uh, specific societies, specific voluntary associations, it has worsened the corruption levels in our countries. It has worsened our dependency levels on the external world. We have become the problem. Since independence, you know, someone one time said that um, people have done, uh, I, I, I have some uh, person who one time was saying that when you reach 30 years of age, uh, it's no longer saying that my parents were poor, my brothers were poor, that's why I am poor. It is now your responsibility, it's now your problem. Now, right now, Africa is now 62 years old from independence, talking about Uganda specifically. So, Will we still really still have these arguments that the colonialists are the ones who caused us the problem, or we are not doing something? Even when we are doing something, we are so much taken up by our primordial public. The primordial public, I mean those religious institutions we have. Someone might decide to, to, to build a church of 100 million, and yet he earns only 5 million. So what will happen? The person will have to balance books, swindle money from the public sector, What's in the corruption levels, and people are scrambling yes, uh, for the public. For let me can stop it at that Yeah, I was when... going to stop by saying that that becomes a problem. We have an internal yes. problem, and even though we have to consider the external world, it can also be connected to the internal dynamics of our institutions. Now we're not Listen, 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 Okay, and let me conclude in a second. Okay. Um, so I was still saying that, uh, I, yes, yes, I was saying that in that process, you realize that there are internal problems that we do have. And let me network. Yes. Uh, you, am I not clear? Yes, you're clear now. I'm saying that that has now that now explains the the nature of our political economy the at the piece. moment. Yes, yes, that explains the nature of our political economy at the moment okay. because we have refused to accept that we have an internal problem. Then the internal problem has really swindled the sums of money from the public sector that we consider immoral, and yet okay. we don't. Uh, Richard, you know, I think yes. you can hear. So, I, let's go to Richard. I think you. The network has betrayed you. Richard, uh, we see All two right, issues. You. We see two issues. The issue of, of, of debts for Africa and how politicians have used these debts to lift Africa out of problems. What are those, the reason why these people borrow money, the reason why governments borrow money. And then the question of colonialism neo-colonialism. Should we really, after six decades, blame the, the colonists on Africa? We see some countries transforming from the poor countries into the world developed countries in two decades. What do you think is the problem? Is it colonialism or what do you see, Mr. Richard? 
Yes, uh, Joram, I, I, I think in my own opinion, there are three points to make here. Point number one is priority. Point number two is federalism. And point number three is imperialism. Uh, on priority, Joram, it is true that our leaders borrow money for the wrong things. Anything in Africa can work out if we solve the leadership question. We have a lot of questions, we have a lot of problems, and we have a lot of factors that we can consider. But truthfully saying, if we don't solve the leadership question, then there's nothing we can do. I am saying this because if you look at the verdict that are passed by our leaders in relation to, to the question of, of, of priority is key. Someone would rather make a specific group of people poor simply because he thinks they might put them out of power. Now, the notion that leaders in Africa focus much on power and authority as compared to the economic transformation of Africa is the biggest problem. That's why we have a lot of uh, dictatorial regimes that have longed on power but doing nothing. And they are popular about that. Why? They control the middle class and whoever does not support them will collapse. An example in Uganda here, we no longer have an institution led by a person from central here that makes Richard, you seem to have a network problem. 50 billion, or the URL is. You get for funding the regime, for funding the downfall of the regime. So where we have uh, leaders focusing so much on, on the power and the power struggle bit, then economic transformation we usually cannot avoid such crises. So they get money. Wherever they get it from, for the notion of protecting their uh, the notion of economic transformation option, and has been one of the biggest issues, which is embedded within the African vote by the NRM that federal is for Uganda. Hmm? Uh, I will, I, will, I will specify for, 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 for Uganda that federal is for Uganda and whoever bring talks about federal is, is, is against, you know, the bigger unitary system of Uganda. It's, it was an idiotic move. It is sick logic because if you go to Kenya, there is federal, but there is no Uganda. If you go to Nigeria, there is federal, there is no Uganda. South Africa has federal, there is no Uganda. The UK, the USA. So corruption can only be contained in such environment where the governance structure allows a small percentage of money to go to the central government. Let 75% remain within the federal states. That's how Kenya is doing it. That's why they have governors. And then let the small percentage, which can be swindled, or which is intended for the national importance, then go to the central treasury. But look, all taxes as they are collected in Uganda go to one treasury. And then that treasury determines which area should develop first, which area should be given money first. This then implies that you see, they can choose to say, this area never voted for us, let us not give it money. And then, openly, they will come up on media and tell you, whoever talks about federal, talks about Uganda. So I think the, 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 the key question in this discussion and debate is, there is a wrong notion of leadership strategy that we have in Uganda. Then, my last point uh, is that of uh, imperialism. Loans, Joram, are being used as a tool to suppress each and every African country which has ever developed. If you look at the IMF records and the World Bank records, we don't have any country on the entire planet that has been developed by loans. So until when African leaders sit and start finding an African-based solution, we're still going to be victims of the circumstances that are created by those loans. I'm going to give you an example. We are being given loans, and whoever is giving us loans does not consider the capacity that we have as a country to pay back. For them, what they consider is the returns of, of, of the policies that they want to put in place. For example, look at the Agoa deal. You get 
much of it was much much of it as much as it was it is straight. It was supposed to be facilitating so that bill. They are saying Uganda is a global goal. And a lot of loans have been given the construction of, of loads under UK, under UK. And these loans have had an implication that we cannot pay them, not only on time, but also they are too huge for Africa to survive. Um, uh, a good example. As you about, conclude, as yes, you conclude, I conclude please. Uh, the, 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 the big example I, I, I can give you is that of China. Look at how China has invested heavily in uh, infrastructures in Africa. But which African country has been able to pay on time? Of course, record is shows zero. What does that imply? That now China will have an influence on which businesses to put in Uganda, meaning, or in Africa, meaning Africa cannot then start businesses which outcompete Chinese products here. That's how they have grown their strength. So the question of imperialism, okay. we cannot leave it out in this discussion. It's priority, federalism, and imperialism, which are the biggest problem. And until we get to okay. it, who can find the African solution? We are still victims of this second. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. I think, Kenneth, you can hear me. Uh, this, Kenneth, how is the question of death, uh, colonialism, and the Africans who are always running to Paris, running to IMF, running to China, to beg from them? How I see you condemning colonialism that went six decades back. Why don't you blame the Africans who are getting debt from the foreign countries, from the foreign institutions, and then misusing it instead of delivering it and using it better for those institutions that can lift Africa out of diseases, poverty, and the problems they have? Yes, Mr. Kenneth, please take on. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joram for that very good question. Uh, I'm not saying that colonialism, I'm, I'm blaming colonialism, yet it is the past problem. Colonialism planted, planted, beca became the root cause of everything and planted other more problems. Like I mentioned, uh, problems of beating up about the bush, us, making us idealists, yet we are formerly capitalists and all of that. So on your, back to your question on dates. The question on dates is that Africans, we are getting these dates first and foremost. We are getting dates not on African interests, whereby we get debts, we get loans, but these loans have very many, uh, very, ma very many goods on them that are making them, making us not so much independent while paying back these, these loans. But also most importantly is that we are wasting a lot of money in, in for example, the government giving it sort of a lot of, of, of roles to play. And in so doing, the government becomes very big and resources are wasted. Whereby now these loans come and they are doing work which is not supposed to be done by those loans. And at the end of it all, we are unable to pay them back. And what results into that is that the government imposes a lot of taxes on the producers in, in a way of trying to prove to these debt, debtors that they can repay the loans. And at the end of it all, the government ends up killing the economy, whereby people cannot venture into businesses anymore because the businesses are made unprofitable due to high taxes. And another thing is, I am still on, 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 the, on the issue of democracy, whereby democracy is becoming, is a fallacy that is creating false hopes to civilians and to producers, thinking that in a better, in another government, they can do better. Yet this democracy is, this democracy wastes our national resources whereby these leaders or, or rulers, they have to, for example, use such loans to just amuse their supporters. And in so doing, they are not performing the roles of the government. For example, like infrastructure, security, peacekeeping, and instead these loans are, are diverted into 
abusing supporters and also fighting opposition. All of those are dangers of democracy. And then another thing is, is a uh, lack of rule of law, whereby these loans come, but they are people who dictate, not on policies, on the policies which are set, but they are people who, who dictate, and for them, they are above the law. No one can talk about them. And at the end of it all, they end up mismanaging these loans and these loans becoming unproductive. But otherwise, getting loans from outside wouldn't be a challenge as long as these loans are got on African Afro interests, African interests, not like these people are forcing us to behave like they are behaving. They are forcing us that if we are giving you this loan, you must, for example, accept homosexuality. And also if these loans come when the civilians know that they are going to perform duties of national importance, not getting into politics. And also these loans coming when we know that they are going to perform specific roles of government, not government going into uh, the, the public sector, like health sector, like education, what? Let the loans come and perform duties of government, like in developing infrastructure for people, uh, for, 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 for entrepreneurs and producers to do their services and also sell their products, like security, like uh, all those. Otherwise, thank you very much. I love the discussion. But about, uh, let me hit on, on Richard's, Richard's, Zigund, or Richard's idea of federalism. A federalism, yes, it is good because it, 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 makes, it helps us make small governments. But in an African setting, whereby we encourage voluntarism, Federalism is so much on tribal basis. And it's instead of promoting patriotism, federalism promotes nationalism. It promotes pride. And sometimes that pride is not good to make economic for, for economic um, economic voluntary vo voluntary trade, for example, between those federal states. But the best thing is is empowering the civil society and also empowering the markets, empowering entrepreneurs. And it's not forced states that are going to unite Africa. It is the markets and the civil societies that are going to unite Africa. So it's not about creating more yes. states, but it's about yes. empowering civil societies and entrepreneurs. Thank you, Yes, Jura. Yes, Kenneth, you, the last point was empowering markets. We see the world over the societies that are advancing, that are prospering, that are fighting the problem of diseases, problem of poverty. Uh, those societies that are embracing free market ideas, that are those societies that have their economic freedom index high, the countries of Scandinavian, like Singapore, Hong Kong, those that come from top list are all embracing free market ideas. Why do you think Ken, I mean, Richard, why, don't, why do you think these African countries are not coping the leaf of free market ideas, empowering the market? For example, setting a proper system of rules of law, respecting property rights. Why, don't, why do you think there is that problem in Africa? And Africa, if we are to look at the economic freedom index of Africa, it is Botswana that actually opened its economy and people are quite improving in terms of their standard of living. Why do you think Africa cannot improve its market and then let people do their business and then prosper? Richard. Uh, yes, uh, Joram, once again, I would appreciate the offer. Uh, just to record a bit about what uh, the current speaker talked about. Just as brief as possible as you take the question. That is to say that you see even right. Even even if you go to UK, there are the Irish, the Scottish. So it is it is psychologic. I want to assume that you see because Uganda is built on tribalism that we cannot uh, employ it here. I think there is a big problem there. The the notion. 
of a uh, discussion to do with free markets and why Africa is not coping up with it, like I, I earlier stated, is um, priority. The network, Richard. Richard, you are muted. Joram, can I be heard? Am I heard? Richard, you are muted. Can I be heard now? Richard. Yes, yes, yes. Go on. Yes, I'm saying that the question of, of leadership still goes back as a problem as to why countries are not opening up their borders and are not allowing entrepreneurs to thrive in this uh, economic spectrum. Uh, the problem, like I already, I already stated, is that we are focusing on the wrong things. If you look at Museveniomics, who has been at one point a liberal, who has at one point become a Marxist, they don't believe in the ideas 